Do you like novels that require you to understand Einstein's theory of relativity before you can read the novel? If so, then you'll love Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain. Before we begin the review, we have to answer two questions. The first, and there are three possible answers, no, kinda, and yes. Did I enjoy reading this novel? And the answer is yes. The second question, and the most important question is, would I ever want to reread this novel? And the answer is no. Okay guys, welcome to Whiskey and Literature where we read and discuss the greatest books of all time, the best stories that have ever been put to paper, and occasionally the worst books, and all those in between because all the literature is ours. And while we're turning those pages, we're sipping those bottles of those finely distilled spirits. I'm your host, Captain Mike. Thanks for being with me. Our book today is The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann, the German monster of a book. I had such high hopes for this novel. I listened to a podcast, The History of Literature, on Spotify. And those two guys, the hosts, were gushing over this book. One of them, this was his favorite book of all time. Now, he had some emotional attachments to this book. His then-girlfriend, who became his wife, gifted him the book. And then when he had little children, he held them on his lap as they were sleeping while he was reading the book. So I get why he loves this book because he has fond and great memories while reading it. And possibly he actually enjoys the book as well. Unfortunately, I don't have these emotional attachments and I did not really appreciate the story. But let's start the review with the author Thomas Mann. He was a gay German novelist born in 1875, passed away in 1955. He was married had six children and his children referred to him as the magician or sorcerer because he was so cold towards them and maintained such a distance from them. He left Germany in 1933 when Hitler came to power and he immigrated to the United States when World War II started. It took him 12 years to write this book, all the things that were going on in Germany in the early 20th century when he was trying to write this book. And so that is very understandable why it took him Quite a long time. And before we get to the book, we have a quirky question to answer about the author himself, Thomas Mann. Would I like to sit down with him in a nice pour of whiskey and talk about E equals MC squared? And the answer is no. Any guy who is referred to by his children as the sorcerer because he is so cold and distant to them is not someone I actually want to have a conversation with. Let's get to the specs and stats of the book. It's a Bildungsroman. We watch Hans as he grows from a child and then he goes to the sanatorium and he grows further. Though it does vary from a lot of examples of this genre because he doesn't become self-actualized or grow into somebody worthwhile or respectable. He just kind of grows into something, but nothing that we admire at all. And it's also a modernist novel in the way that it portrays the land down below. The book version that I have, this is the original translation by Helen Tracy Porter Lowe. The audiobook that I had was translated by James E. Woods, and it is a more modern translation. And I listened to probably 75% of the book and read about 25. And there were quite a few differences between both translations. One huge glaring one was there is a chapter called Walpurgis Night, and there is a conversation between Hans and his love interest. And it is nine pages long. And in the original book, and in this Helen Porter translation, it is entirely in French. Whereas in the audiobook version, it was translated into English. And I understand that Thomas Mann wanted that in French and not in English. But as a reader of the book, I actually appreciated it being in English so I could understand what they were saying. And this book does lend itself to the audiobook format. I really enjoyed listening to it. David Rental, sorry if I pronounced the name wrong, he did a fantastic job narrating this book. I thoroughly enjoyed him and I recommend to you if you're going to read this book to listen to it. 
The book was published in 1924. My paperback copy here is 716 pages long. In the back of the book is an afterword by the author Thomas Mann called The Making of the Magic Mountain. And he explains the inspiration for the book. Actually, his wife went to a sanatorium because she had tuberculosis. And this is important. Thomas Mann visited her for three weeks. And also, this is important. He got sick while he was there and he was encouraged to stay further. And that was the inspiration for this book. And he suggests, encourages you to reread the book to fully understand and grasp what he's kind of trying to say. Unfortunately for him, I will not be rereading The Magic Mountain. The major themes of the book are life, death, space, love, time. Again, I bought this book on Amazon and I paid $18.73 for it. I had a credit on Audible, so I kind of got the book for free. If you had to pay for the book, you would be paying $27.99 to listen to the book. And it's 37 hours and 27 minutes of listening time. And another win for the Kindle, if you prefer to read it that way, it is free on the Kindle. All of the main characters are allegorical. I'm finding that this is a trend in these classic books. If you read a Tom Clancy book, nothing in that story is allegorical. None of the characters, none of the places, none of the things. Jack Ryan, he's Jack Ryan. He doesn't represent a Greek god or a political ideal or a philosophy. These classic books are a little different. Everybody has a meaning. So let's talk about the main characters briefly before we get to the book. The main character of the book is Hans Kastorp. He is a German young fellow and he represents Germany. Again, think about all the things that were going on in Germany in the early 20th century. All the things that Thomas Mann was seeing all around him. All the options that Germany had. Where was it going to go? What was it going to become? Hans Kastorp embodied this. The next two characters are Settembrini. He embodies humanism and NAFTA and he is radicalism and they argue the entire book page after page chapter after chapter trying to win the favor of Hans Kastorp with their arguments and their points it goes on throughout the entire book the next main character is Madame Chachot and she embodies love sensual pleasure lust temptation the next main character is Peppercorn, and he embodies the Dionysian principle. He is also the personification of one of Thomas Mann's main rivals. He represents spontaneity and passion. And the last main character of the book is Joachim Simpson, and he is Hans' cousin, and he embodies duty, steadfastness, fortitude. So in the book, here's the story. We meet Hans Kastorp. He's a young German dandy who graduates university. And before he goes to start his internship at his shipyard as an engineer, he wants to visit his cousin, Joachim, who is recuperating from tuberculosis at a sanitarium. And he wants to go there for three weeks. And he ends up staying for seven years. And then he goes down the mountain, goes off to war, and presumably dies. That's it. That's the entire 716 pages. Nothing happens. And if something does happen, it's irrelevant compared to the thoughts, thoughts, the feelings felt, and the speeches spoken. Oh, wait. A couple things do happen. They get a gramophone later in the book, and Hans Kastorp likes to listen to music, and they do some seances with a Ouija board. Talking, talking, feeling, feeling. That is the book. Technology, morality, space or speed versus time, motion versus time. What is time? If there is no motion, is there any time? I want to read to you a small part of chapter 38. I've got to put the glasses on. Just a very small part of this paragraph, which I think is just the entire book. Chapter 38, titled Changes. What is time? A mystery, a figment, and all-powerful. It conditions the exterior world. It is motion married to and mingled with 
the existence of bodies in space, and with the motion of these, would there then be no time if there was no motion, no motion if no time? That is the book. If we don't move, if we don't do anything, does time pass? Do we want that time to pass? In the book, 180 pages for the first three weeks of time that occurred. Over 25% of the novel in pages to get 1% of the time that passed in the story. And that was deliberate. We lost track of time while listening to the story. Sometimes time would speed and slow. We would leap ahead months, sometimes even go backwards in time so that I and the main character, Hans, didn't know what time season. And I say season because it could snow in July. It could be summer in February. Disorientation was the name of the game. And after all that, this is a great time for the whiskey of the week. And today we're coming at you with Maker's Mark. And not just any Maker's Mark, but the Private Selection series, Bourbon Sweet Dreams. It's a five to seven year old bourbon cask strength that is finished in a barrel with 10 possible staves or combination thereof for 1,001 possible combinations depending on the customer's specifications. My bottle here is 108.4 proof and I paid $79.99 for this bottle. I haven't had any of it. I did open it just a second ago because it was a pain to open. I haven't had any of it. We're gonna try some right now. I'm excited for it. I do have two other bottles of Maker's Mark Private Selection. Haven't tried any of them. And it's been a while since I've had any Maker's Mark. Smells nice. It is cask strength, like I said, 108.4 proof. That's up there. That's a good, uh, that's a good amount. It's easy. It's not burning. I'm no expert. I'm no whiskey som. I just enjoy it. That's very nice. I get a lot of flavors in there more than I can explain because I don't really know what they all are. I'm still learning to distinguish as best I can the different flavors as I'm drinking whiskeys. And I have an aroma kit that I'm gonna share with you guys at some point that Mrs. Captain got me for Christmas. And I love it, it's been a lot of fun and I'm hoping to use it to learn to appreciate the whiskeys that I have more. Einstein's theory of relativity. It is actually related to this book. It is the book or the book is the theory. I'm not sure. And so what is the theory? I get that it's time for an object in motion depends on the speed of the object relative to the reference of an observer. I don't really understand that. I feel like I can grasp a little bit of it, a glimmer of understanding. It's kind of like when I watch the movie Interstellar. Do I understand it? Kind of. And this is how time passed for Hans Kastorp. In leaps, fits, starts, bounds, depending on what he was doing. The first time he took his temperature, it took seven minutes. And to him, it seemed to take forever. He said he did 1,001 things during this time. And when he couldn't take any more, he checked his watch to see how much time had passed. And he still had one minute to go before he could take the thermometer out of his mouth for the seven minutes hadn't passed yet. Quote, does novelty and emptiness dispel the content of time while monotony and emptiness hinder its passage? Do you have a VR headset? Have you played super hot VR? And a side note, if you do have a VR headset and you have a favorite game, comment below. I have one, we're just getting a nice content of games, but I don't have a lot yet. If you have a favorite game on the VR headset, Comment below, let me know. But Super Hot VR, it's a game where you fight other opponents by striking, you can throw objects or shoot them. The novelty of this game, however, is that if you stop, everything stops. Time stops, your opponents stop. If they fired bullets, they stop. If you fire bullets, they stop. Thrown objects, midair, stop. 
And if you move, it moves. Everything moves. Time begins again. The faster you move, the faster time goes. And if you stop, everything stops. That's one of the concepts, the main concept of this book, super hot VR. There is one line that man thought was so important that he italicized it. It's the only italicized line in the entire book. And I'm going to read it for you. No explanations. I'm going to put it up on the screen as I read it. And I hope you enjoy it. Because of charity and love, man should never allow death to rule one's thoughts. I'm finding that in these classic books, they often have a number that recurs over and over throughout the book and has a special meaning, whether good or bad. In this book, the number is seven and it's supposed to have magical powers. Hans Kostorp is seven years old when his parents died. He spent seven years at the Berghof Sanatorium. The Walpurgis night scene occurs when he had been there seven months. Setembrini, one of the main characters, Sete means seven there are seven tables in the dining hall they take the temperature for seven minutes and the original book itself has seven chapters of all the books i have read there's only one chapter title that i could tell you of them all in the wheel of time a 14 book series over 11,000 pages who knows how many chapters i know there's a chapter called do my swells and if you ask any fan of the Wheel of Time, can you name a chapter title in the series? Invariably, they will say, Do My Swells. When those guys were talking in the podcast I listened to about the Magic Mountain, they mentioned the chapter Snow. It's the title, Snow. And I was excited and eager to get to this chapter. It's kind of a ways into the book. And I was in despair by this point. And I was like, Great, I'm getting to the snow chapter. It's gonna be fantastic. They both gushed about it. And even this chapter let me down. Okay guys, I would imagine that you can understand how I feel about this book. I'm glad I read it. It's one of the classics. It's a must read, do it. But I am never gonna read this book again. And I understand that I'm blasting through these books at a rapid pace. I don't have time to fully absorb and think about what I'm reading. I'm just reading the story and if it's making sense to me or not. I kind of grasp at this, kind of like I've read and I kind of grasp Interstellar and Einstein's theory of relativity. I don't really understand it any more than I understand what this book was trying to say. I'm not gonna reread it. If you want to, go for it. Cheers. One last thing before we call it a night. Next book, Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, an American author. This is the 1855 edition, 12 poems in it. I don't read poems. I've never read a book of poetry. I had Mrs. Captain read one of the poems in this book yesterday. She said it was interesting. So I'm excited to read it. Nice thin book. Should be a quick read and the review coming up soon. For now, my friends, turn those pages and stay thirsty.